Project Lawful aka Plane Crash by Arwain aka Eliezer Yudkowski and Lintamande. Thread 1, Mad Investor Chaos and the Woman of Asmodeus. Episode 59. Keltham tries to figure out how he'd feel about telling the Chelish government. Well, not to give him Carissa or else, because, like, that is stupid on so many different levels, both as decision theory and as a trap that Isidra could be setting for him if she was less than absolutely trustworthy. Please give him Carissa permanently or until he gives her back, to do with as he pleases, and have that be the regulation of Cheliax, and not just an arrangement between the two of them formalizing what Carissa gave him informally, as Carissa herself wants according to your very smart people. And in return, Keltham charges Cheliax very, very slightly less of their GDP increase, or some such. It's not particularly landing at this point. In a world with pilars, Keltham can see, somehow, not with the eyes of Dathilan, but with the eyes of his own sexuality, that had no place available for it in Dathilan in a way that wasn't anyone's fault. Keltham can see how there could be a submissive woman, gender subtrape that is like being pursued and dated, but more so. He can imagine how that gender subtrope of woman might think it was more romantic for a man to desire her so much that he came in and just took her away, paying cost to do that but never asking. The question of how this ends up with the right people matched, and without giant, flaming, obvious incentive problems, if a man likes a woman who doesn't like him back, may perhaps rest on Galarian institutions unknown to him. Or it may be a reason why this desire, unsatisfiable in reality, is fed mainly by Galarian romance novels. He can imagine that Carissa wants that, even if he's pretty sure he's not imagining it correctly, true to the real Carissa Sever. It's enough to explain why a possible person would want that. To be in... metaphorical bedchains, in her larger social and legal situation chains that she wears always, as proof that a man wanted her that much. Carissa wants it. Let's suppose that to be true. Does that situation appeal to Keltham himself? Not really. The part where Carissa gives herself to him feels deeper and more meaningful, to him, than that choice being taken away from Carissa so that Keltham no longer knows she's still making it. It's a choice that says Keltham is worthy, that he and his sexuality are worth so much to Carissa, that she has judged him and chosen him, even though she could have had another, that he is valuable to Carissa in a way he was not so valuable to any woman in Dathilan. Is there some way you still get that in full measure, if somebody is with you because they can't escape within Galarian and have opted not to escape to the afterlife? Keltham isn't seeing it, for now. Maybe his thoughts are being too crystalline and logical about it, too denying of subtleties and forcing it all into, well, but then therefore, where people could just opt to not conclude that therefore. Maybe there is a way that Keltham can know Carissa still finds him worthy, even as she lives truly in the world where she has no other choice. Well. Like the Detect Desires spell, for example. If you have that around for people who can afford it, then it is obviously going to change some things. Shit. Does Isidra do that to the people around her? Cast detect. Desires around them, or have it cast by a cleric who reports to her, and maybe not a cleric of Asmodeus either. Keltham is trying not to believe it too hard, but his brain just shouted very loudly, Yes, she does, because Isidre knows far too much about what various people want and it is extremely the sort of deontology violation that you'd expect from a good person with a deficit of law, an overly powerful intelligence headband, and horrifying problems that are horrifically large. Isidre would reason that the privacy violation was just not really that important, on the scale of twenty million people. And even if her intelligence headband lets her fake some intuitive shadow of the law of coordination, she might still argue to herself, that knowing more true facts about somebody is not something that ought to cause a breakdown of coordination. Keltham isn't even sure she's wrong. He doesn't have her problems. Call it 75% probability. But suppose Carissa is fine with detect and desires being used on her. Though maybe that aspect has to be illegible so Carissa doesn't have to admit to herself that she could escape by wanting to be free. 
Well, leave aside the deontology violation of doing it without asking, suppose the thought experiment anyways. Or maybe, Carissa says, Keltham is entitled to detect desires. Her and Truth spell her whenever he wants, because that is part of what it means to give herself to him. And they never have to make mutually legible why or whether Keltham is doing that. Consider that least convenient possible world, for the argument against putting Carissa in a situation where the absolute power, Keltham thinks the Taldane word in baseline, that Keltham has over her, has been formally materialized and made real. The world where Keltham casts detect desires every morning, or multiple times per day, because least convenient possible world, and the spell always says that Carissa still wants him, and judges him worthy, and would have him hold absolute power over her. Then what? Then Keltham does not really see the added appeal from his perspective, but it is not obviously, or not legibly obviously, something he couldn't do for Carissa to make her happier, at little cost to himself. Except for where his mind just screamed that he is tilting further on that dangerous narrow ledge he is standing upon. And also, Isidre warned him not to have that done to Carissa unless he wanted it for himself. Keltham doing it because Carissa wants it is probably not what Carissa wants either. The Galarian woman's romance novel is about the man who wants you that much, in that way, and not because he thinks it is something you need to be happy. Maybe someday Keltham will come to feel for himself the thing that is the male complement of the gender subtrope that Carissa has, where he wants for himself to make that absolute power real, and cast detect desires as a guardrail around it and make it so that if Carissa can't stop wanting him, then she can't stop having him either. Maybe someday he'll understand better the grounds he stands on in Galarian, and it will no longer seem like something that would get you kicked out of most cities in Dathilan. Well, no, not actually. They're just not going to do that to you in Dathilan. If Carissa is standing there saying, Get the fuck out of our private business, civilization, I don't need you to protect me, no victim, no crime, as the proverb goes. So it isn't like that. But maybe someday it will stop feeling like that. Also, civilization would... What would they even think of a situation where Carissa is going, Let me out, civilization. I don't want to be here anymore. To test the bounds of the chains placed on her and be reassured that they are real. And Detect Desires is showing that Carissa wants desperately for civilization to laugh maniacally and say, No, you belong to Keltham now. Keltham is sad he will never get to subsidize this question in a voting prediction market. He really wants to know what civilization would think of it. Well, no, actually he wants to see the enormous flame war and very serious people shouting at each other. That would happen if this question really came up. But also he wants to know what civilization would think of it. What does the Keltham verse think of it? The Keltham verse is what, three days old at this point? The Kelthamverse knows that it's a tiny baby world, and wants to refer the question back to civilization, so that it has a good starting point. But mostly this thought search has reached quiescence. There is not much expected value of logical information in searching further. Keltham finds no desire within himself, for his own sake, to transform Carissa's free gift to him into a metaphorical chain that she wears always. And for him to do it for her sake is almost surely not what Carissa wants. He will reopen the question when and if he finds within himself that gender subtrape that is complement to Carissa's. And meanwhile, he is not going to say anything to Carissa that sounds like, never forget, you've got the right to leave at any time, because that would be stupid. It's somewhat nerve-wracking knowing Keltham is thinking and having no idea what he's thinking, being totally unsure whether at any moment he'll say, Great, okay, I resolved all my internal good training, go crawl into the fire. Or, hey, was that Isidra secretly the Queen of Cheliacs in disguise? It was inferable from several things she said. Or, I've decided Cheliacs is too good, can we relocate operations to Rosmiron? Or, actually, coming up with scary things, Keltham might say, isn't a productive thing to be doing. What if instead she tries to understand magnetism, so she can be impressive next time they try prestidigitation, and then whatever happens will happen. Give up hope and endure. Carissa, meta question. If I suspect Isidre of doing something that might or might not be incredibly criminal in Cheliacs, maybe it is. Maybe it's the sort of thing people like her are quietly expected to do. Is that something I talk to you about? 
Wow, that's substantially worse than crawl into the fire. At the world wound, you are obligated to report things like that to a different lawful church if you think your own might fail to handle it. Here, I guess talking to me about it is a reasonable thing to do. Let me think if there's a reason not to tell me. Are they going to have to escape? I think you should tell me. Isidra knows way too much about what various people want, and this isn't Dathilan, so the people around her don't have a good sense of what you can't do with just an intelligence headband. I suspect Isidra of having somebody, maybe a cleric not of Asmodeus, casting detect desires and reporting to her. If she's not that cleric herself, come to think. Or maybe it's also a wizard spell I didn't think to ask. Anyways, I'm at 75% probability. That's what she does. And that's taking into account how little I know. Targets would have included you, Pilar, maybe me if Asmodeus didn't specifically direct otherwise, and possibly, I am less sure about this part, the Queen of Cheliax. Even in Taldor. But old Cheliax is Taldor. New Cheliax is Asmodeus's. Safer not to lie. Except for how everything is a lie. Carissa has never found lying to be difficult before, and these days it's like navigating a dungeon blindfolded. The fact that Cheliax could mind-control Keltham and hasn't is useful evidence of good faith, and also she's already told him that, but also making it clear that Keltham wouldn't notice if sufficiently powerful people did, it makes it impossible to preserve an escape avenue where Keltham concludes, there's a rot that doesn't extend to the top. I'm going to start by saying things I'm very sure of and then get to things I'm less sure of she says. So, invasive divinations by default feel like something it's possible to notice them happening to you. Probably a uh, Contessa Lorelatha or the Queen herself could cast an invasive divination you couldn't even detect. They could also do mind control that felt like your own choices, but anyone much less powerful than that would be running a reasonably high chance that their targets would notice unless there are some powerful secret magic items involved, which there might be. When you cast Detect Desires on me, I felt it, and I could have attempted to fight you off and probably succeeded. We should make sure you know what that feeling is and that you haven't felt it at any time in the last couple of days. Strongly predict you haven't, though. When the priest on duty at the World Wound first got a revelation from Asmodeus about you— his instructions to me suggested that Asmodeus had very firmly prohibited a very wide class of things, including some we don't even think of as bad behavior, with respect to you. I haven't noticed unexpected invasive divinations or enchantments cast on me, though I consented to a truth spell and some invasive divinations for security screening for this project. And I'm third circle, not fourth. That makes a substantial difference in how powerful you'd need to be to be sure I wouldn't notice. And Pilar's second, which makes her even easier to hit. And Pilar might have agreed to screening for various weird things when she got back from Elysium because she'd spent a bunch of time around chaotic outsiders. Trying to cast an invasive divination on the Queen of Cheliax is definitely an incredibly serious crime. Like, they would execute you on the spot after making sure you weren't spying for somebody sort of crime. I think trying to cast an invasive divination on people involved in a secret project would be considered a big deal also. I, it might be one of those things where the church and the crown aren't entirely on the same page. It is definitely the kind of thing you'd report at the world wound. Somewhat reassuring. And also... In retrospect, I shouldn't have said 75% for Detect Desires. That was too narrow a hypothesis. Rookie cognitive error. Magical items, sure, maybe, a function on that irreplaceable relic headband. Or, is there something that's like fox's cunning, owl's wisdom, eagle's splendor, but for reading people? True, not that damning, sort of inconvenient to admit, but Keltham's already noticed a bunch of its correlates in various places. Yeah, there is. Uh, not a spell, but there are magic items for it, and it's a stereotype about nobles that they're all ridiculously enhanced at it. That would plausibly be it, yeah. I don't know what it can't do. 
and if it's legal and not considered socially unacceptable, then a Cedra seems like the sort of person who's extremely likely to get the most powerful version of it that exists. Well, maybe I ran ahead too far of my inference speed limit there, too influenced by the trope where you walk up to somebody and grimly say, I'm sorry, but I'm afraid you know too much, and then prove that they couldn't have reached their conclusions from only the information they were supposed to have. It would be more likely that Isidre was doing something undetectable and legal than that she was doing something incredibly illegal and where she might get caught. Of course, Doth Ilan has stories about that and finds a special joy in discovering and uncovering it. Abandon hope and endure. No. Win. I'm still not sure what a trope is, but yeah, I'd expect someone in her position is much, much likelier to be achieving her results with powerful magic that no one really objects to. It works just as well if the other person has mind blank up, which is the intuitive line between just being uncannily good at looking and using invasive magic. Mind blank. Eighth circle, incredibly powerful abjuration that provides approximately categorical protection against divinations and enchantments targeting you. You can't get around it with a wish. That's how powerful it is. If someone tries to scry the room you're in, the room will appear, but you won't. If someone casts Detect Intelligence, they'll detect all intelligent minds in the area except yours. And there's magic items of it, but they cost eight million gold pieces, and who knows, they might be cursed. I actually don't even know a magic item of it to exist at all, but if it did, it'd certainly be priceless. And it can't possibly be what it sounds like. But I'll ask anyways, just in case. Wish? Does what you ask for, which is very bad and dangerous, and there are organizations that'll kill you if they suspect you're trying to use a wish. There are known safe phrasings for, like, 15, 20 things, very powerful things, but not nearly as powerful as the spell's capable of. But if you try something, there's not a known safe phrasing for extremely bad things will definitely happen. Combo with twenty auguries, Keltham says, before it occurs to him that maybe he shouldn't be giving ideas like that away. Duplicating auguries doesn't work. You get the same answer. But there are more powerful spells for talking to one's god, like Commune, and Ninth Circle wizards with an INT of thirty do occasionally advisedly cast powerful wishes, which I assume is how we got the known safe phrasings we do have. How the flaming noodles do you get to INT thirty? Even with a plus-six intelligence headband, you'd have to start from INT-24, which is Dath Elan plus three, and then that takes you to Dath Elan plus six. I'm not sure we even have anybody who's actually that smart, and not just a measurement breaking down. If anyone here is that smart and not restricted from communicating like gods are restricted, Golarian shouldn't exist. One of the known safe wordings of a wish is intelligence enhancement. Just plus one— you need a chain of five wishes cast in immediate sequence to get plus five, and that's the most wishes cast in sequence attested in all of history. So you'd have to start from 19, and we don't throw one of those often, but in all of history, we have. I don't know why having INT30 didn't cause them to solve everything wrong in the world. Maybe INT30 doesn't actually perfectly correspond to the Dathilan plus six. That was a thought that had occurred to me earlier. Yeah, but with people supposedly INT-30 running around, I feel a lot more credence in that thought. That detect intelligence isn't measuring everything that Dathilan thinks of as intelligence, and that the spells and headbands only enhance what we'd see as one relatively narrow aspect of intelligence. Dathilan separates smartness into a lot of factors, I suspect what you call intelligence and wisdom together would be, like, three of seven main ones, or some such. Somebody with general smartness 30 and not just intelligence 30 should shred apart the reality of Galarian as they walk through it. I don't think there's any way you can be that generally smart and not figure out, like, the idea of selection on heritable variation. That could be. Though, also, maybe Archmage Nex a thousand years ago figured out selection on heritable variation but didn't, uh, tell everybody because who knows if it'd have suited him. And there's no one that smart around now. What's the current highest INT? If there's Detect Intelligence, then is there also a Detect Wisdom spell? 
What's the average wisdom of a wizard-tracked student with intelligence 18? Probably the smartest person alive is Nefreti Klepati, the Seventh Circle Wizard and Ninth Circle Cleric of Nethys who heads the Church of Nethys in Sothis. She's... Nethys touched, so by all accounts, sort of insane, and probably has, like, a 26 for both intelligence and wisdom, though I don't know for sure. I haven't met her. There is also a detect wisdom spell, and wisdom is a tiny bit higher than average for wizard-tracked students, but not that much higher. Maybe 12? Wisdom increases over the course of your life, though unlike intelligence, so it'd be higher if you were looking at those same people at age 25. Anything else on the same level as intelligence and wisdom that Nefreti also has a 26 in? Not that I've heard advertised, but again, I haven't met her, and one of the few stories I know about her are that she caused a massive explosion that flattened the temple of Nethys in Sothis, and Nethys gave her several more cleric levels for it. Sounds like a kind of cool god, frankly. That said, I'm never praying to him. In Keltham's mind, a hypothesis is taking shape, a mental model. To a chelish eavesdropper, it would look like rather a lot of blank. Seeing the idea as Adathilani sees it, compactly and at a glance, requires a grasp of underlying math. If Keltham wanted to say it to Carissa, he would need to spell out rather a lot of things and also use a whiteboard. Keltham's thought revolves around a standard Dath Ilani concept that Taldane has no word for. Intelligence, translated into this word in baseline. But Keltham is starting to suspect that this reflects a mistake that Carissa and other language donors are making, not a translation accurate in the world. For translation purposes, one must then fix a new term. Call this one thinkumpf. Thinkumpf is optimization as done by humans. Its figure of merit is correct prediction, choice of action leading to desired outcomes, the power of inner thoughts over the outer world, the power of cognition to apprehend and effectuate reality. Of course, humans do this in a weird, idiosyncratic way, and a random possible simple optimizer that was about as powerful as an average Dath Ilani would not understand and manipulate reality in the same way as an average Dath Ilani. But if everyone involved is a human, then to speak of thinkumph as a thing humans do, whose figure of merit is optimization, is not too unsensible a concept. Keltham does not need to think about this part right now. He has already chunked the notion of thinkumph long ago. Thinkumph is a view into the processes that humans do to produce optimization, viewed from the standpoint where its purpose is optimization, and where the information theoretic goal of the viewpoint you're taking is to make it easy to describe those usual variations among humans that contribute to the variations in their optimization power. Thinkumph, then, is not a single number, but a structure with some internals. But it happens to be empirically the case that a lot of usefully discussable smartness components map not too terribly onto a unidimensional line, such that holding the rest of a mind constant, you get more optimization power as you move up along the line. For ease of visualization, then, consider Thinkumpf as a seven-dimensional thing, because it happens that there's a useful component, analysis like that in Dathilan, which gives you seven dimensions. Or consider Thinkumpf as a machine with seven gears, each of varying size. If you don't want to visualize seven dimensional objects for some weird reason, suppose Detect Intelligence gives you an imperfect partial view of Thinkumpf that's made up of, say, one, speed, clarity of information retrieval, plus two, how much information you can maintain in short term memory. Detect Wisdom gives you an imperfect partial view of, three, the piece of Thinkumpf, that's perceptual clarity which critically has a subpiece, 3A, that is clarity and detail and accuracy of introspection, which is to say, shifting viewpoints from the machinery to the result that machinery produces, that detect wisdom imperfectly measures the machinery that grinds to produce reflection. In Dathilan, the proverb poem goes, Beware lest what you can measure easily becomes all that you measure. Beware lest it become all that you optimize. Beware lest it become all that you ever think of. The people of Galarian know how to detect intelligence and detect wisdom, and that's it. So they think there are two components of Thinkumpfi. They invent two spells to boost the thing that detect intelligence detects and the thing that detect wisdom detects. They invent headbands to boost the thing that detect intelligence detects. The amount the headband sells for depends on how large of a shift it produces in that handy spell, 
detect intelligence, which, as everyone in Galarian knows, detects intelligence. If the detect intelligence spell says that a headband produces a plus three to intelligence, it's worth less money than if detect intelligence says that the headband produces plus four to intelligence. Imagine now that nobody has invented detect wisdom yet, just detect intelligence. Imagine that somebody with a vision of broader think oomph builds a new headband that would, if you could also run detect wisdom, show to produce a plus three to intelligence and a plus three to wisdom. This headband is probably more expensive to build than the one that produces plus four to intelligence, probably by a lot. And the detect ham intelligence spell says that it produces an inferior result than the plus four headband. So nobody builds a headband like that if they don't have detect wisdom. Does either intelligence or wisdom incorporate creativity? Outside the box solutions, outside the box hypotheses? Maybe when Keltham dares to try on an intelligence headband, if he ever so dares, it'll be immediately apparent to him that this headband boosts every part of cognition that Owl's wisdom didn't boost. But Keltham is guessing that this will prove to not be the case. Consider, then, the world in which Galarian has a detect intelligence spell and a detect wisdom spell, but these are only three out of seven components of cognition. It's not the kids with highest thing oomph who get tracked to be wizards. It's the kids with the highest detected intelligence. It is, of course, famously true that in humans, and describing humans is what the concept of think oomph is all about, most things you can measure about think oomph's components or outputs will all correlate with each other quite a lot. The kids with intelligence 14, which Keltham thinks was supposed to be the wizard tracking threshold, do tend to have wisdom 12 rather than wisdom 10. But if you were looking not at random at somebody with intelligence 14, selected on high intelligence, and asking what are the rest of their think oomph components like, then the rest are probably more like what their wisdom score happened to be. When you select on kids with high detected intelligence, you're not just selecting for kids with high general think oomph levels that produce high intelligence. Along the way, you're selecting for kids whose intelligence is unusually high compared to the rest of their think oomph. That's why the wisdom comes out as 12 instead of 14. Dathalan has heritage optimised itself over generations in full awareness of how all these measurement and optimization gotchas work. They are doing their best to measure real-world results broadly and doing genetics and statistics to them. Dorothy Lan does not want to end up testing some weird projection of Thinkumpf that originally started out correlated with Thinkumpf, optimising over this weird projection and ending up with optimised things that have much more of the weird projected quality than they have Thinkumpf. Dorothy Lan wants actual Thinkumpf and is explicitly not pursuing it the stupid way. So you've got your kid with intelligence 18 and wisdom 14 and they get wizard tracked and get a plus six intelligence headband. Or maybe if they become spectacularly successful, a relic with plus six intelligence and plus four wisdom, and if they're incredibly insanely successful, they get two or three layered wish spells on top of that. They end up, say, with 27 intelligence and 21 wisdom. In Dathilani terms, those subcomponents of Thinkumpf would now be at plus four, 5SD and plus one, 5SD respectively. But their other four out of seven Thinkumpf characteristics are still around 14, or in Dathalani terms if the scales match, 2SD. Golarionites don't know how to easily measure these other components. They don't try to boost them. They don't think about them. This sounds a lot more like a model consistent with Golarion than the model where anyone with plus six Thinkumpf has literally ever existed here. You don't need training to be a keeper at plus six Thinkumpf. You just are one. Inside Keltham's mind, this is all a much shorter and better chunked thing to think. What he thinks, roughly, is, hey, maybe they got Goodhart's cursed on intelligence and wisdom metrics. Only Keltham's actual thought is that Thinkumpf is the underlying true value. Intelligence and wisdom are imperfect proxy measures of Thinkumpf. Optimization over intelligence and wisdom will select not just on Thinkumpf, but on upward divergence of measured intelligence and wisdom scores from underlying Thinkumpf scores, that this applies both to selecting students for wizard tracking and for boosting them with intelligence headbands later, and that this will, of course, produce people who may detect as plus four intelligence and plus four wisdom, but who started with something like minus two or minus one, underlying general abstracted correlation of Thinkumpf components, and now have something more like plus one final optimization power as a result of all that intelligence and wisdom boosting. 
Nobody with plus six think oomph has ever walked through this place. They'd shred it around themselves like tissue paper. Putting a pin in something to follow up on later, Keltham says, after the few seconds it takes for him to think the compact version of the thought. Detect my wisdom. If it's twenty, that's very bad news for your heritage optimization project, and makes my heritage substantially more valuable. If my wisdom is fourteen, that's much better news for you. Underlying reasoning behind that statement is going to take a drawing wall, though. Do. Wishes by any chance need to be spoken in a strange, inhuman language? Wreaking total havoc, if you state things the least bit incorrectly, seems obviously reminiscent of bare metal systems programming. A couple of the known safe wordings are Taldane. The others are other things, but other human languages, I think. Can you invent an artificial language and say a wish in that? Probably, but you'd be starting without any known safe wordings, so... Look, I am sure Dothilan has an equivalent to this, uh, a thing where smart people immediately start thinking of a clever way to do it that will get around all the things they've been told might go wrong. But the clever way will also go wrong, and maybe we'll eventually be able to use wishes to do stuff. But I think you are lacking the background of how everyone always tries to come up with a clever way to use wishes to solve their problems and they sound like they'll work fine and then they don't and it's a disaster, which you'd have if you were from Galarian. And it's not that I don't want to rewrite the fabric of reality just by speaking aloud. I'd love to. Carissa, I wasn't considering doing that on any remotely near-term timescale. I'm not completely shit-pooping insane. I was just curious if anybody had maybe already tried the thing that Adath Alani thinks of in half a second. Namely, casting wishes with a real, actual, proper specification language. Or maybe that's overkill, and all you need is baseline, instead of flaming Taldane. Keltham isn't betting on it. He's not going to try it. But he sure is thinking it. Okay. Just, we have, uh, maybe a trope about people going, oh, I thought of a clever way to do safe wishes no one tried before, shortly before there's a smoking crater a teleport distance across. Asking questions is fine. I don't know anyone to have tried that. Don't do anything that would make Broom give me a sad look. Got it. Though this smoking crater business, again, sounds like a result you would absolutely get, if what you needed was a programming language for bare metal systems programming, and what you used was spoken colloquial Taldane. To be fair, if that's true, it's a puzzle why any wish works, let alone asking for an intelligence boost. Maybe he'll look into known safe wordings and unsafe wordings, and check if there's anything really, really obvious going on there, if the person reading it is a computer programmer. Maybe he is being a typical Dathilani male in a certain way, and he should stop doing that. I think I should maybe focus on the massage for a bit, relax again, and think about Isidra's other sexuality requiring cognitive challenge posed to me. So far, I've done one of two. All right. She was kind of hoping that Keltham would be annoyed about her being argumentative at him, but either he wasn't, or it just didn't occur to him that if you're annoyed at your girlfriend who belongs to you, you can hit her about it. Oh well. Massage in silence it is. After a bit of silence, relaxing again, mentally leaning into the massage, and yes, very briefly poking some internal curiosity about what exactly it is that is Pilar's obligate fetish, precisely speaking, Keltham returns to contemplating more sexual questions. How does he feel about renting Carissa out? Mostly, he's still getting a what from his brain. Can he evaluate it concretely rather than abstractly? Not without having actually met the Queen of Cheliax at all. Okay, but... Keltham does know some people. He even knows some female people, in case this is a polarized gender trope with respect to the renting individual. How does Keltham feel about renting Carissa to his Max Mutual Word Count co-author, from his fixed circle back in Dothilan, who happens to possess the requisite parts? Sad about never writing anything with her again? Also, she's probably not a sadist like at all. Also, maybe it actually is not a terribly good idea to think right now about people who believe he's truly dead. Keltham knows some female people inside a totally different universe that is not that universe. He doesn't know them very well, but he can ask himself the concrete question anyways. What if he were to rent Carissa to, say, Tonya Barrero, 
in repayment of the debt he owes her for an unexpected, unvolunteered in advance, at best semi-consensual truth-spelling. Still file not found here, he doesn't know Tanya well enough. Keltham knows what to do in this cognitive situation. For purposes of testing this function, keep supplying imaginary values to the Tanya structure until he can complete the function call. If at any point he gets a negative result, he can then tweak values to see if there's any value that produces a positive result instead, and then he'll also know what properties he's looking for. Let Tonya be a sadist, but like a young sadist who's only slightly more experienced there than Keltham, and in no danger of providing Carissa with an unforgettable experience, less forgettable than other experiences she's already had, thereby causing Carissa to leave him for Tonya, who is the superior sadist. Actually, Keltham is not sure he really needs this part of the spec. Carissa's current attraction to him is not because Keltham is a super sadist, and therefore it is perfectly pseudo-reasonable that you can't steal Carissa from him by being a better super sadist. Alas, that which is perfectly pseudo-reasonable is not always perfectly reasonable. Anyways, fix the current values at favorable ones to see if this function returns false, even under quite favorable circumstances. Tonya can hurt Carissa slightly more than Keltham, but not threateningly so. She can't give Carissa an orgasm due to Carissa's Eero-Larp character arc posing a sex problem, so Tonya's not threateningly better than him there. And if Tonya was, Keltham could always just tell Carissa she's not allowed. Okay, something reacted to that inside him. That didn't react to hearing about the magical item belt of no touch. Possibly because in this case, there was any reason for it and that made the scenario more real. Or say mostly, in this scenario, Carissa is being rented to Tonya in order to provide Tonya with not necessarily reciprocated pleasure, just like if Tonya had bought a sex worker in Dathilan. Suppose Carissa doesn't hate it. Keltham's Carissa Model is now complaining that he is not supposed to check this, and that offends her dignity of being harder to hurt than that. Well, sorry, Carissa Model, that is not what Keltham is optimizing right now. Carissa even manages to have a moderately fun time, because Tonya hurts her some and reacts in a way that makes Carissa feel pride in her own sexual skills. And it actually matters to her that Keltham told her to do it. Postulating this part feels hard. Keltham is not himself a Carissa, and he is not sure what it is like on the inside to be a Carissa. Keltham thinks he is at least not, obviously not okay with this whole sort of thing. It feels a lot like asking, in an ordinary relationship, how you would feel about your partner going out for a night with somebody else who'd been like, yeah, screw flirting, what's your monetary price? He wouldn't have objected to that back in Dathilan. He wasn't that monogamous with anyone. That these feel like similar questions probably reflects Keltham failing to get to grips with the actual gender trope here. Isidra seemed to think this should not feel like the same gender trope as sex work, even if it had similar gender ratios. For one thing, Keltham was aromantic back in Doth Elan because he is a romantically obligate sadist, or at least the very first masochist he ran into was the first person he ever started feeling at all, like he needed something from her that was about it being from her, and didn't funge with things he could possibly get from somewhere else. How would Keltham feel about Carissa trading herself to somebody for one unskilled labor week is, like 1.2 gold or so? Let's say 2 gold. Carissa is hot. Parts of Keltham are not happy with this, because Carissa is his. Because Keltham is insecure about whether that would mean Carissa still liked him more than she likes anybody else. Because Keltham is supposed to give permission first. Keltham doesn't know. But if Keltham orders Carissa to do it, for whatever reason, then that's okay. Possibly. At least if all the other call values are set to imaginary Tanya settings, and with likely settings on the Queen of Cheliax, rather than favorable settings on Tanya. If, in exchange for an ultimately insignificant symbolic amount of money, and with at least some pressure on the side to deny a trope, and perhaps the entire theory of tropism, Carissa is rented to a brosomething throne. Older than Carissa, with the same de facto ability to chain her for real if she really wanted, assuming that Keltham did not object, which he would. Probably a much, much more experienced sadist than Keltham, 
with access to far more powerful sex toys that are the equivalent of overpowered vibrators with biofeedback functions and, yes, the ability to make Carissa come. It's not quite an obvious no. It basically depends, Keltham is pretty sure, on whether Keltham is afraid that Carissa can be taken away from him by somebody being a better sadist to her than he can be for a while yet. If somebody is the more skillful manipulator of masochism, of what did Isidre call it, submission, can they steal away Carissa's feelings from him? The threat of giving Carissa an orgasm, the threat of also having potential absolute power over her, seem less real than that. Keltham's hindbrain, which may, of course, be entirely factually wrong about everything, intuits that it is basically not possible to steal Carissa by giving her a good enough orgasm. Hurting her, maybe, understanding the deep keys to her sexuality that Keltham is still struggling with, but not with humanly reasonable amounts of pleasure, short of dangerous drugs. And as for the absolute power threat, in part, it doesn't feel as real because Keltham has not internalized a model of whatever it is that Carissa has inside her. But also, it's impossible for two people to both have potential absolute power over someone. If they came into conflict, after all, only one of them could get their way. So long as that person would be Keltham, rather than the Queen of Cheliax, everything would be fine, right? It just has to be clear to Carissa that if Keltham and the Queen fought over her, Keltham would be the one to end up with her. If that's true, the keys to her sexuality would be safe. Not that Keltham is thinking that he can, like, wield more political power inside Cheliax than its own, nearly unilateral chief executive. But the Queen of Cheliax has to be sensible and consider things like political capital with the Church of Asmodeus, while Keltham can be much less sensible and walk out on Cheliax if the Queen steals his girl from him. It shouldn't be about power alone, Keltham doesn't think. Differential willingness to use power should be an acceptable coin to Carissa's sexuality. It controls who would actually end up with her if it came to that. Keltham's not willing, not today, to bargain a probabilistic or absolute walkout on Cheliax in order to tell the government of Cheliax to hand Carissa over to him in legal reality, to say that he considers her a necessary part of his gains from trade. Telling Cheliax that he considers Carissa a necessary part of his gains from trade, and he'll walk out if the Queen steals her, either by kidnapping her or by renting her from Keltham, but then giving her an experience that shifts her romantic focus away from Keltham to the Queen. She's Keltham's. The Queen can't have her except temporarily. Sure. That he feels totally willing to do. Carissa would probably find that hot. Keltham's Carissa model confidently finds it very hot if Keltham actually wins at it. But Keltham is not entirely confident in his Carissa model. Well, at least Keltham should definitely win. He can't really see any functional chief executive being like, Lal, no, I'm going to take Carissa and watch you walk out on Cheliax. And even if the queen wanted to, her advisors would stop her. She's an overly good person in an overly good government that has to be stopped by Asmodeus from resorting to outright mind control when it looks like that might be for the greater good of the country. Keltham isn't pure evil, sure, but he's not that good, which means he should win this particular contest. Of course, that's only if people are running on sanity. If the Queen is running on tropes, she'll try to steal Carissa, no matter how bad it would be for Cheliax if she succeeded. But then, if those events are running on tropes, it's impossible to win Carissa's true love sexuality without winning a fight for real power over her. The Queen should ultimately fail to do that after making worrying progress, and then end up kicked up out of Cheliax, and or harem recruited. Anyways, he's got enough of an answer that his next step is to ask Isidre to meet again and check his model of how all this works. Or, ask Carissa? He kind of wants to ask Isidre first, before he tries to talk with Carissa. Isidre is more willing to be legible, and nothing blows up if he says the wrong thing in front of her. Carissa has thought up a reasonable amount of opinions about contraception and magnetism, Despite being distracted every few seconds by contemplating the fact that Keltham is probably contemplating Isidre's offer. The Queen? There's not actually much point contemplating what having sex with the Queen of Cheliax would be like, and not just because that definitely counts as flirting with her. It will probably be awful. 
Carissa is a grown adult and is going to go to hell someday and can handle awful. It'll probably be, so being hurt isn't upsetting, being hurt can be fun, and even when it's more than she can take, like the cursed bag, it's not upsetting, it's bad, but it's a specific kind of bad, that's all right. There are things that are actually upsetting, and thinking about them is just asking for it, no, she'll just think about how to orchestrate a convincing demonstration of suggestion to Keltham instead. Pending questions resolved into a state of quiescence, Keltham relaxes more into the massage. It's nice. Does he want to command some non-reciprocated sexual service from Carissa at the end of this? The idea of ordering her to do it seems more comfortable now. Possibly it has something to do with having heard that she has any coherently imaginable endgame. Maybe it's just a shock, having had time to sink in, and for Keltham to adjust. But then, his libido might go offline for a while. He shouldn't expend his newly refilled Aero Reservoir if he needs to have another conversation with Isidre today. It's not clear how urgent this whole thing is, exactly. Carissa, Keltham says out loud, his voice coming out sounding as relaxed as he is. I'm too relaxed right now to really want to move, so can I ask you to have them return my reply to Isidre, that I'm interested in further discussing her second suggested course of action, though I'm not yet on a definite yes? And can I possibly get a yes-no in the next ten minutes about whether or not Isidre wants to meet me again today? It wouldn't occur to Keltham that Isidre might not imagine him to be capable of a quick reconsideration and answer. One hour is a long time to think in Dathilan, and sure it may take longer to reconsider some major life questions, but there's no presumption that you can't do it in an hour. It similarly wouldn't occur to Keltham that he ought not ask a senior governance official for a yes-no answer in ten minutes. Somebody like Isidra is surely interrupted often enough, and good enough at task-switching, that she's checking her tiny task queue every eight minutes in Isidra's computer-based and network-connected task management system which will continue to go on existing in Keltham's imagination and his pre-programmed social reflexes, unless and until he thinks explicitly about that question for literally half of a second. I'll ask, but she might not be interruptible that soon, says Carissa, who'd say that even if Isidra wasn't the Queen of Cheliacs. Keltham has further thoughts on renting Carissa to the Queen of Cheliacs. That's terrifying, but definitely a success. Carissa is going to let herself enjoy her success without dwelling too much on its implications for whether she gets tortured, which is ultimately not the thing that matters here. How would Carissa know that if it was true? But if it's info Carissa shouldn't have, from his perspective, on the gaslighting hypotheses he's always considering in the back of his mind, she wouldn't just blurt it out, would she? If they were that bad at LARPing, they'd have screwed up by now, surely. Of which it is said in Dathilan, being suspicious is easy. Being suspicious of the correct one out of the 1,000 pieces of information you receive today is hard. Make it so, Keltham says. And then continue the massage, if you're still okay with... Rephrase. Continue the massage, and tell me if you're running out of easy energy for it. So she steps outside, flags down some staff, and delivers Keltham's message for Isidra. I told him that someone important probably couldn't get him an answer in the next ten minutes, but if she happens to be free, or reading my thought transcripts full-time anyway, hi, Abigail. Abigail does in fact have a country to run, and either Otolman suddenly really likes Cheliax, or she really dislikes somebody else. Abigail had not in fact realized before now how incredibly important it is to not piss off Otolmans in any way. However, she does realize it now, and Aspexia can stop repeating it at her. Carissa goes back in to give Keltham a massage. They'll knock if they get an answer. The massage continues to be nice. Keltham doesn't especially feel like massaging Carissa back, apparently, if he is honest with himself about that. He would do it if they were trading pleasures, obviously, but he does not seem to really actually want to give massages. He still feels grateful for it, and a need to do something nice for Carissa in return no matter how much she says he doesn't have to. He wants to, anyways. Keltham doesn't feel like massaging her back. But he does feel like buying a massage for her as soon as he's got any gold pieces. That seems like the blatantly obvious solution. 
the thought of a stranger touching Carissa's naked body does not feel especially pleasant. Keltham is not used to his brain working like this, and it's causing his self-model to stumble over itself repeatedly. He could pay one of the other girls to give Carissa a massage from him? For that matter, if he doesn't have any gold yet, he could tell Ione to do it after she's recovered. Is Keltham allowed to do that? Does it count as something Ione offered him? Well, Keltham doesn't have any massive anti-legibility issues with Ione, so he can just ask, which will make his life massively simpler. Keltham's guess is that Ione's objection, if she has any, will be that Carissa might ask what got traded to Ione for the massage, and Ione doesn't want to mention the Nethys thing to Carissa. But they could just tell Carissa it's a secret, so that doesn't seem like a problem. Seems like a plan. If you wish to support this AI reading and others like it, please visit patreon.com slash askwhocastsai. Any help is appreciated. And thank you to executive producer John Doe 7776059.